have it from the open government that evil stalks the world in the form of the pernicious wrangling that is the United Nations bureaucracy. And we think that the United Nations has blood on its hands. And we're outraged that the very people that the United Nations promises to protect are dying in the streets because the UN doesn't have the capacity to protect, doesn't have the mandate to protect, and has shown itself entirely unwilling to protect. I think that undermines opportunities for regional leadership. I think that undermines nation building within troubled states. But most importantly, we think that undermines conflict prevention. <coughs> if you the status quo, I think that one of the problems that pervade the United Nations peacekeeping missions are that they currently have no mandate to fire. We have no mandate to fire. We think that that undermines their capacity to act in conflict zones and that undermines their credibility. So we think the norms and frameworks, but more importantly, the practice of international law should legit legitimise the dispatch of military forces, of the armed forces of individual states to trouble zones. But it's going to be the proposal of the opening government that once nations hit the United Nations list of failed or failing states, that's people like the Sudan and like the Congo, like Rwanda, once they hit that list, we should be allowed individual nation state who will very often choose to act alone, but who, say, under the purview of the European Union Rapid Response Force might choose to act in concert to dispatch their armed forces to that state in the name of protecting the citizens of that country. And so we think the way in which this is going to work, the way in which this is going to work in practice is we think there's got to be a clear declaration from that nation or those nation states to the United Nations that it intends to do this. It's got to be a clear assumption of responsibility from that nation. And their function's going to be twofold. It's going to be peacekeeping in the interim. The where there exists a conflict, be it civil war or be it, a, be it government attacks against an ethnic minority, their immediate mandate is peacekeeping. But furthermore, we think they're also going to have a long-term mission, and that mission's going to be peacemaking. We think that when they can bring in the United Nations to do things like supervise elections in the long term, that that's highly desirable. And there's one more thing, and one more point I'm going to make in this today, and that's that the missions will be temporary. That is, that there's an absolute obligation upon nations to go in to withdraw when the conflict ends. We would be very, very clear. This isn't necessarily mutually exclusive if, say, the conflict escalates and the UN gets around to sending in its own mission. But we say that given the failure of the UN to do that, we think that this represents the future of humanitarian intervention. I'm going to give you four things, I'll take you in one moment, four things in this debate today. I'm going to talk, firstly, about this question of prevention. Then I'm going to talk about the bureaucracy and politicking of the United Nations that undermines their capacity to act. And they're going to talk about this problem of mandate for arms and how that's played out in practice. Fourthly and finally about this question of capacity and what that does. Madam, you say you're going to create a toothless UN, yet at the same time you're saying these people will have an incentive to, tempo, to, to stay there temporarily and to pull out. How can that happen when the UN you're proposing is a toothless UN? You just can't enforce that. No, yeah, yeah. So the UN made itself toothless. So that the UN showed itself unwilling to act. That the UN Why showed... Back? That the UN showed itself failing and disinterested to act in Rwanda, in the Sudan, that it showed itself an absolute failure in Sierra Leone, that it showed itself a failure in Bosnia. And that being the case, we think that from an immediate question of imperative, there's a need for nation states to go into act. Because when we talk, firstly, about this question of prevention, there are two types of failed or failing states. And there are instances where the government can be salvaged, where the conflict can be remedied. And that's something my second speaker, Naomi, is going to consider when she talks about the implications for nation building, when she talks in particular about the, about the question of regional development. But then we say there are situations where sometimes governments can't be salvaged. We say that it's in that case where atrocities are likely to be committed that a military response is demanded. And that's why the United Nations just isn't willing to provide. But let's ask ourselves firstly about any kind of response, because we say the United Nations showed itself unwilling to respond in any way to the conflict in the Sudan. 
but it showed itself unwilling to respond in Rwanda until a million lives too late. And that it showed itself entirely unwilling to act in any meaningful way during the atrocities in our South Door in the 1990s. You said that there are two causes of that. The first is bureaucracy, that the UN wrangles and wrangles and wrangles, and that it takes an inordinately long time to get things through the United Nations, and that holds it back from acting. But the second is political, that in the United Nations, certain nations act in their own interest to keep things off the agenda. We think this is exactly what happened in Rwanda, when the French who were arming the Hutu militias kept Rwanda off the agenda in the Security Council until far too late. And we think that's exactly what happened in the Sudan as well. And that's when nations say that it's no longer good enough. That's when NATO says that it has to go into the Balkans instead because the UN can't and won't do anything. So that brings me to this question of the mandate for arms, because it's the UN-sponsored missions and an inability to fire in conflict zones that means it's unable to act to protect those that it needs to. And here we point you to the example of the rape of Srebrenica, where an enclave that was under a UN mandate was stormed by, Soviet, by the Serbian military, where every single man was killed, where every single woman and child was raped. And UN peacekeepers, because they could do nothing else, stood there and watched. And we say, that represents the great moral outrage that is the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen. We say that where that mandate for arms doesn't exist under a UN sports initiative, where it clearly exists with military forces, the right to use that force must be recognised in the name of protection rather than just military offence. And that brings me to this question of capacity. And we say, because nations are in command of their own forces, because they're in their own region, and because their military can be assured of their own protection, they'll be willing to act. So this House believes in the protection of the vulnerable. We're very proud to protect There's a problem with UN oversight and saying that the solution is not to get rid of it, but rather to reform it. And this is what we're going to propose coming from Adria de Marina A. We say that our counter-proposal says that a three-fourths authorization majority from the UNSC, and that includes revolving web members, Mr. Chair, will allow multilateral intervention to countries of conflict. And we say that there will be three criteria for them to allow this particular intervention. Number one, Mr. Chair, is of course the imminent but not necessarily immediate threat to international security. Number two is the occurrence of crimes against humanity and genocide, and that's all. There are two only, I said three. Anyway, Mr. Chair, what am I talking about today, Mr. Chair? Let's make a clarification before I proceed. Given that particular proposal, we're saying that the prohibition of unilateralism does not always guide the end to unilateralism. Let's make that clear, because there is, of course, the United States. However, what it does do, at the bare minimum, is that it forces states to consult other states and to articulate other state interests with theirs, Mr. Chair. And this is why our policy is a lot more efficient than their policy. Because at the end of the day, what our policy does is that it strikes a balance, no thank you, it strikes a balance between two things. Securing particular countries that are in conflict, but at the same time not making the, the involvement such that only one particular state's interest is articulated, Mr. Chair. So you get the best of both worlds. Before I proceed, let me rebut the arguments coming from the previous speaker. The first argument she raised was, of course, this whole argument of Sir. bureaucracy. No, thank you. And then they talked about how the UN is bureaucratic. That's why we're going to get rid of the bureaucratization of the UN through taking away the veto power of particular countries and making it a three-fourth majority. Furthermore, she said, there's politics. And because there's politics, people will have selfish interests. Yes, people have selfish interests, and what you want to do is to allow these people with selfish yeah. interests to intervene on their own here, here. Here, here. The balance of other countries. We accept that realpolitik argument, but we see that realpolitik argument works for us. And then there's this problem with the model. Before I proceed, let me first talk about the model. They say that under their model, countries will only enter temporarily, Mr. Chair. But they never said what the incentive for particular countries to withdraw is, Mr. Chair. If you look at the Iraq, the United States has not withdrawn, Mr. Chair. So that's just fluff, no thank you. We see that if these people are acting out of interest as what you said, there is an incentive, Mr. Chair, to stay until they get what they want there, Mr. Chair. And only a multilateral framework will actually allow these people to 
stay only uh, temporarily and not permanently or indefinitely as is, what, as, is what, as is what's happening in Iran right Sir, now. Before I proceed, yes. Under your proposal, there'd be no peacekeeping mission in Rwanda. Is that okay with you? No, 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 no. The reason why there was no peacekeeping mission in Rwanda was because there was a veto. Under our model, you can get rid of that particular veto because if particular nations vote and there's a three-fourths majority, they will be allowed to enter places like Rwanda. It's more efficient than that, Mr. Chair, and it's quite different. Let me argue three things. Number one, I'm going to be talking about how your model essentially privileges stronger actors in the international sphere. Number two, I'm going to be talking about how your model prevents initial diplomatic actions which could prevent conflict and bloodshed to begin with, Mr. Chair. On the first argument, let's look at how your model privileges powerful actors with vested interests. Now, the reason there are other people, the reason why we need other people, though, thank you, is because we need to talk about particular acts of intervention. Real politics, Mr. Chairman, will say that states have particular interests and they not only have interests when they intervene, when they choose to intervene, but in the process of intervening as well, Mr. Chair. So that when you intervene, even if the decision to intervene was right, what you're doing once you've actually intervened may still be beholden to your particular selfish interests, Mr. Chair. And the reason why, Mr. Chair, we need multilateral action is precisely because we need oversights for this particular selfish state interest. So thank you. We say that under the status quo, anyone who acts unilaterally and does so, Mr. Chair, without articulating other people's interests will look unreasonable. What our model does is that at a maximum, it forces them to seek UNSC approval, which means they will be beholden to the oversight of the UNSC. At a minimum, though, thank you, at least force it forces states to consult other states and to create legitimacy. So even if you still opt to um, engage unilaterally, Mr. Chair, you will not have you will not be perceived legitimate. Therefore, you will need to consult other people and articulate other state interests, Mr. Chair. Under their model, no thank you, these people will just attack unilaterally, will not consult anyone because it's legitimate under international law. No thank you. And we say they cannot hide behind those technicalities in international law to legitimate, to legitimate self-interest at the end of the day, Mr. Chair. And this is what happened in Iraq. Second argument, essentially I want to talk about how your model prevents initial diplomatic action. Because let's listen to the model raised by the Prime Minister. Once a particular country is on that list, and I don't even know what the criteria sure, sure. for being on that list is, Mr. Chair, a country can attack another country. Never mind the fact that there are other mechanisms to first negotiate with these particular countries, to resort to diplomacy, to resort to sanctions. What they're saying, Mr. Chair, is to take that initial action immediately, Mr. Chair. And if we say that under our unilateral model, a lot of people will want to take that immediate action immediately without these other processes, mainly the United States, before I proceed closely. And we think it's a good idea that people act immediately in the case of the genocide, not after you've had some sanctions. We say that if there are, we say that the problem, if the problem is immediate, then you will be able to get a three-fourths vote under our model. But, Mr. Chair, we say we strike a balance between that and, of course, caution. Because you cannot always act immediately without considering what the effects of intervention are. Because sometimes, as with the case in Somalia, Mr. Chair, even if people were dying, when they intervened in Somalia, yeah, yeah. more people died because of the intervention. So just because people are dying, that doesn't automatically legitimize the fact that you intervene immediately. You have to calculate those particular risks. And under your model, that risk calculation, that cost-benefit analysis, doesn't exist because if any single country wants to become a home, Mr. Chair, they can enter, Mr. Chair, and you'll have another Somalia under your hands, Mr. Chair. We see our model sets a balance between security, safety, and of course, responding to these particular threats. The last argument I want to raise in this debate is essentially I want to talk about how unilateralism promotes resentment in the local population. This is the reason why, Mr. Chair, certain interventions may be more dangerous. Mr. Chair, that's actually not intervening. Because this, the population you're intervening may be angry at you or may be resentful to you. What increases the odds, Mr. Chair, of local populations being resentful to particular interveners? It is the fact that these people are not supported by anyone. It is the fact, Mr. Chair, that these people are violating, well, not violating, since it will be legal under international law, that these people do not care about the interests of other states, that these people can be perceived to be selfish, Mr. Chair. And we say that's the problem with Iraq right now, because of the perception of the people that these people are acting selfishly. Now, even if people aren't necessarily acting selfishly, we see the perception exists, such that these people can become targets of the actual violence, and they, in the intervention, it's more violence than the situation pre-intervention. And because of that, at the end of the day, it begs the post. point of information, from the opposition bench, which is a problem with making the UN a toothless 
tiger. But what we've already raised in a responsive point of information is that as soon as you abolish the veto, the major contributing powers to the UN are most likely to withdraw from the UN. And that's how you make the UN a toothless tiger. Despite the fact that we heard no response at all to the variety of practical concerns raised by Julia, no response to the need for immediacy, no response to the imperative of another body being able to enter the humanitarian crisis. First, let's look at the implications for the UN. And Julia already talked about the capacity of the UN and how that's limited. But we say, if Russia could have the right to stop people now, could no longer have the right to stop peacekeepers going into Chechnya, they're likely to walk out the door. If America could ensure that the Middle East wouldn't occupy Israel, we'd say that they're likely to withdraw. And when America, for example, is, uh, gives 22% of the United Nations budget that goes to humanitarian relief, we'd say that's a very big problem. But the second thing we heard about how their model was different to ours because it forces consultation and the communication of interest. In the same breath as conceding that nations operate with a selfish interest at heart within that very forum. Ladies and gentlemen, we say that consultation and communication still happens under our model when you have to profess the fact you're going in in the first place. The difference from the opposition bench is that that communication and consultation will halt the very operation Wait. of humanitarian relief. Just like you <coughs> mentioned in France, with France, who managed to block that the uh, humanitarian relief going into Rwanda. And we say that's what communication is all about in the form Madam. of stopping intervention, it's not very healthy. Yes, sir. Madam, we say that these people, even if they have selfish interests, precisely because of those selfish interests, precisely because they don't want to look bad in the international community, if they're doing something illegal, they will consult under our model and will not consult under your model. We'd say that no one has got a real incentive to go and do something illegal if they already think that peacekeeping in that area is worthwhile. That's not an incentive to go and commit atrocities in another country if you happen to think that humanitarian relief <coughs> is important. But this leads me nicely to the next point, which is about legitimate self-interest. And the fact that NATO has operated outside the EU when it comes to humanitarian relief, such as in the Balkans, such as in Arche. We don't think the nations who would be likely to take up this type of activity, all the organisations like the EU, have their self-interest at heart. But the last argument we heard was that of resentment and the population will be angry at you, ladies and gentlemen, like because entering with a humanitarian relief is a lot worse than being raped, a lot worse than a genocide, a a lot worse than community clearance, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be angry whatsoever. And what we heard as the example was Iraq. And I have one response to that, which was that it was not a humanitarian operation. We don't think they're going to perceive to be selfish when the real and tangible benefits of protection flow those people's ways. No thank you. So what I want to look at now is three main points. The first is the problem with UN peacekeepers. The second is why the current status quo and the other model as well are bad for nation building and regional stability. And the third is why this is good for international law. Julia mentioned already the capacity of UN peacekeepers being limited. But what we say is that already in continents like Africa, where the Blue Berets have come to be associated with rape in the Congo, with rape in Sierra Leone, with delayed response in Somalia, we say that they're tainted with a very basic image of inefficiency and of harm. And we'd say as soon as you have that synonymous relationship amongst populations who are not greatly educated, who are removed from the great media, and that word travels fast, you undermine the capacity of those peacekeepers to bring humanitarian relief. Because the, under the fundamental principle of humanitarian relief is premised on the basis of trust and the willingness of people to accept that uh, assistance. We'd say that that is massively harmed under the alternate model. But second of all, we'd say that cultural understanding is also a primary and very important factor in peacekeeping. And when the, the UN sends people from Norway to go fight in the Congo who have no idea of the local language, who have no idea about ethnic com uh, com uh, complexities, who have no idea about the different rivalries among different ethnicities, you severely undermine their capacity to assist. Yes, sir. Very UN intervention. The UN carefully select the nations that contribute soldiers to a peacekeeping mission. 
under your proposed level, it would be justified for Japan to intervene in China for humanitarian purposes. How does that make less <laughs> a great job in selecting the types of people who can do a good job. That's why some of the people I've selected are rapists under international <coughs> law, ladies and gentlemen, and haven't contributed at all in a positive way. But furthermore, as I've also just outlined, you need sometimes people, especially in continents like Africa, especially in other regions of Southeast Asia like East Timor, to have understandings of the cultural and ethnic complexities, which we don't think just happens. But furthermore, armed forces from other bodies are good, and why, uh, I want to look at why the UN is to raise and send missions. And we say that governments want to send people when their own generals can be in charge of their own people, they can be accountable for what they're doing, and they get to make those decisions, and they themselves feel that they have the capacity to protect. But secondly, now I want to look at why the status quo is bad for nation building and regional stability. And we'd say that when the UN sends blocks of troops for alternating six month periods, it's less likely to achieve long term stability, which is bad for trust and bad for progress. And as again, we'd say that other interests from people with from nations within those very regions have a very real interest in the stability and commitment to that project that the UN doesn't have because there's spillover effects from conflict. Things like economic uh, detriment, things like trade being uh, suffered, things like refugee spillovers, things like border skirmishes. And we say that this is a very good incentive for nations taking regional leadership seriously. And my last point is why this is good for international law. And we say that whenever international law attempts attempts to overcome bureaucratic concerns, attempts to overcome the futility of bureaucracy, that it proves itself to be responsive and worthwhile and worthwhile following. So at the end of this debate, ladies and gentlemen, we have one team who doesn't want to render the UN futile, but threatens to take away the power of the major contributors to the UN itself. But we've had an alternative which looks at the very real imperative for change, the very real need need for a real action and a very real need to change the capacity of people to respond to bad states. <coughs> Mr. Chair, the first thing I want to talk about right now in my speech is to show you that the proposal coming from Government Vetch is going to open a can of worms. Why is it going to open a can of firms? Because you're not necessarily making a distinction amongst which states are able to intervene and what particular intentions for this intervention are going to be taken into account. That is why, Mr. Chair, when you talk about a unilateral intervention, as long as there is a list, any state can make a declaration to enter another <coughs> supposedly failed state. So if you look at examples, Mr. Chair, you have states like Angola, Mr. Chair, being invaded or possibly invaded by Congo, which is a necessarily historical uh, 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 opponent, Mr. Chair, without necessarily any checks and balances from other nations. What's preventing China from entering Taiwan, Mr. Chair, by stating that there, there is already some abuses going on in there and they're going to come up with their own selfish interest? And that is what is going to be bannered. In our model, Mr. Chair, that is the beauty of a consensus, please not. And the consensus comes from voting, Mr. Chair. The UN itself is going to determine which of the actors have the capacity and have the capability, and there is a modicum of, of, of an international interest that is going to be fulfilled. It's not as if Congo can just suddenly enter Rwanda or Angola, Mr. Chair, and carry on their own interest, which is not checked and balanced in their proposal. Please sit down. Second, Mr. Chair, I want to talk about the issue of efficacy, Mr. Chair. The efficacy of actually responding to quick threats like what the closing government point of information actually talked about. The problem with opening government is that they assume that the entire UN right now is a failed organization because it can't make decisions per se. But the problem is, it's not the UN that's a problem. The problem is the veto right now. And we already talked to you about, Mr. Chair, how the failure to respond to Rwanda is the, is the problem of France. And they themselves said that, that France actually carried their veto and flaunted it, Mr. Chair. Or maybe any intervention between Israel and Palestine is being vetoed by the United States. That is why, Mr. Chair, in our proposal, we're not letting one veto uh, essentially paralyze the entire UN's response. We're necessarily looking for a three-fourths majority, which is still a majority decision, but it cannot be uh, railroaded by one 
veto power. Let's make comparisons, Mr. Chair. I think opposition stance is more effective in the end. This is not a day later. But another point that we got from the previous speaker is this, that if you suddenly remove the veto, the, U the states are going to walk out of the UN Security Council. But we have to contextualize this debate, Mr. Chair. The UN Security Council right now is being, is, is being put under fire by certain states in as far as supposedly they're only working for their selfish interests. If the US, Russia, China, France, and Britain walk out of the UN Security Council after losing their veto, they're going to look even worse to the international community because it's just going to solidify the fact that they're just working for their selfish interests. There is no incentive to walk out of the UN Security Council, Mr. Chair. In fact, it's going to better their image. Why, Mr. Chair? Because the fact that efficacy is now improved under our model, there is more incentive for them to work not only for their own interests, but to show to the rest of the world that they're not just flaunting their veto for their own particular selfish concerns. That in the end, Mr. Chair, is more reasonable, that in the end is more effective, and in the end, we're not assuming the worst case scenario that everyone is suddenly going to walk out, Mr. Chair, because in the end, they also have image concerns. That is the context of the debate right now, Mr. Chair. Before I go on to my arguments, Mr. Chair, right, I'm going to talk about why a consensus decision is better and why immediate armed response is not always the best case, Mr. Chair. I want to take a point of information. If we could have prevented the rise of Trevor Blitzer by sending in military forces and individual states, should we have? Yes, Madam Chair, because we can do that. Yes, Mr. Chair, because we can do that as well in our policy. That's not mutually exclusive here, from your proposal. Here, here. And don't use hard strings in this debate because we're necessarily fighting for humanitarian concerns as well, Mr. Chair. Because this is what I want to talk about, Mr. Chair, right now, in how you reach the proper decision in the opposition proposal. Why, Mr. Chair? Because immediate armed response is not always the best recourse. And I think Mr. Claudio already built that earlier when he talked about the problem of Somalian intervention in the early 1990s, Mr. Chair. In fact, if you add further examples to this, the Sudan itself, Mr. Chair, demanded that the UN is the one to respond to the problem of the Chan Shabit right now. And if it is the US or any other state that unilaterally intervenes, that makes it easier to escalate the conflict and encourage more extremism from the Chan Shabit, Mr. Chair. This is tough. But in fact, Mr. Chair, let's talk about the plurality of decisions you can reach with opposition proposal. Because the immediate armed response is not always the best. There's always, there are always other cases where in negotiation has reached a more reasonable, less hardline, but still effective proposal, Mr. Chair. If you look at the example of South Africa, Mr. Chair, diplomatic isolation was able to achieve reforms in that state. But in, in the late 1980s, Mr. Chair, suddenly you have this proposal on the table, and this is a proposal that encourages armed responses as an easy first recourse, Mr. Chair. And that is something that we want to prevent. We want to prevent states from suddenly using this as the easy way out. Suddenly using it to unilaterally respond to whatever, to whatever problem they deem to be uh, uh, necessary to be responded to without talking to other states. That is a problem, Mr. Chair. That will make the proposal even worse and the status quo will be further worsened. Before my six, from closing. Why do you think, sir, that the obstructionist and murdering Sudanese government in Khartoum wants the UN to be intervening, intervening as opposed to someone who would make effective changes and stop it murdering its own people? Because, Mr. The Chair, they deem the UN to be more reasonable because there is more state representation there. They're going to get a fairer share of the decision, Mr. Chair, if it is the UN that intervenes. That is why the Khartoum government, and that applies to the piece of asset point of information, they in fact demanded that the UN respond, or at least the African Union, Mr. Chair. But never, never, never a unilateral response from here, just here. one country in the world, Mr. Chair. And finally, Mr. Chair, I want to tell you how you diminish, you diminish the, the, um, the impetus for countries to cooperate multilaterally with this proposal that's on the table from government side. I already talked to you about, Mr. Chair, how several states that are failing right now are demanding that a unilateral response be given to their states in order order to ensure that no one selfish interest is going to take precedence, Mr. Chair. That is the impetus for them to actually communicate with the lateral to cooperate with the organizations that exist right now. That is the impetus that exists in order to ensure that we check and balance each and every state. With that, Ateneo A closes.
Ladies and gentlemen, the opening government team very clearly set this debate in a context. And the context was that the last 15 years have seen a serial record of damning indictments against the efficacy of the United Nations in stopping people from being subject to acts of genocide by their own governments. We say opening opposition, firstly, have accepted that what goes on at the moment, the status quo, is unacceptable and undependable, which is why they wouldn't do it. We're still going to say two things, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, we're going to say the model we've outlined is more effective. Secondly, we're going to challenge um, you know, that there's any clear argumentation given for why it's going to be a potential possibility to achieve the UN Security Council reform that they've outlined. Then what's the clear argumentation going to be from the second team in government? Firstly, we're going to talk to you about a very important principle that this debate needs to have in it. We're going to talk to you about the fact that we recognise certain aspects of universal personal sovereignty. We recognise them as being much more important than the concept of national sovereignty. And secondly, we're going to talk to you about real world, real negotiations, and where they come from, from real quality. And we're going to say, it's not the standard of international law, yes, or international law, no. It's going to stop countries talking to each other and having diplomatic channels and diplomatic negotiations before intervention, having informal contact. We say it's ridiculous as it is. So first, we want to know on the opposition case how exactly this reform of the Security Council is ever going to come about. Okay, so let's have some argumentation. What is more likely? Your policy, which gets rid of years of precedents, or our policy, which okay. is really going to modify the policy of your okay. model is not very feasible. Um, well, I think our model you know, is really quite reasonably feasible. We say, think of our model is we're going to say that the cases where people are being obstructionistic and people are refusing to accept that there's a justified response on you know, humanitarian grounds, when we've shown clear examples and the UN itself has already declared that humanitarian atrocities are going on, we say, you know, we can say at that point, like, fine, out the window of you if you want to be obstructionistic and help your friends for selling you oil. We don't mind. We say, you've got to tell us how exactly there's going to ever be the incentive for the five most powerful members of the UN to ever allow this kind of thing to pass. We say it won't happen. We say what's also important though is they recognise why it's better to do what we want to do than to do nothing. Okay. But let's look at the examples they say of all of the problems that happen at the moment and what's going wrong. They give us two examples. One they give us was Somalia. And we say, the context of Somalia, we say that you know, America didn't necessarily manage the intervention particularly well. We say, certainly what's happened in the context of the United Nations not being able to deal with Somalia, and there not being any kind of aspect of intervention in Somalia at the moment, shows the real dangers of failed safety. We say the fact that UN at the moment is now considering authorising mercenaries to protect shipping off the coast of Somalia because of the problems of international piracy, just shows how badly states go wrong, and how they go wrong at the moment and no one does anything. But secondly, they give us the example of like, Sudan, Sudan. Sudan. No, thank you. They say, Sudan wants the United Nations to involve. Do you know why Sudan wants the United Nations lead any possible intervention? It's because it knows when the United Nations does it that no meaningful action will go against the Sudanese government. It knows it because it's got massive oil links to China, who buy loads of liquid oil and only 45% of its infrastructure. Quite, quite. It knows it because it's getting guns from Russia, ladies and gentlemen. And it knows it also because countries who we might think are quite nice, like India and Malaysia, also invest in its oil infrastructure and help what? it out, ladies and gentlemen. No, thank you. Then they said, what about the African Union? Yeah, the African Union is a great model for doing it, isn't it? Because the African Union recently didn't even discuss the situation in Sudan because Sudan was chairing the security panel and decided it wasn't a good thing to put on the agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, down. Okay, universal and personal sovereignty. What's the clear principle we want to outline in this debate? We say that certain rights are so unbridgeable that they need to be protected and we need to recognise them in a universal framework. We say they're not conditional upon them being enforced for you by your national government. We say they exist at a much more meaningful level. <coughs> <coughs> so, we have a duty as an international community to enforce those rights across national borders, wherever they be in the And we say that's why it's particularly important that we are setting this debate in the context of crimes against humanity. So there's an interesting international precedent measure that's already recently evolved in international law. So the fact that we can try heads of sector to involve the international court so they commit these kind of crimes against humanity already suggested that at the moment the international community has clearly accepted that a nation state is the head of a nation state, so because it is itself a sovereign state, does not have the right to commit those kind of acts for yeah, the yeah. population. We have already recognised yeah, that. Yeah. And we say it's a natural step forward for that, I'm saying. But we also say we recognise the need to intervene in those states, and we recognise the right of any country to intervene in those states, yeah, to uphold yeah. those rights, to uphold those principles. We say that's very important, and I'm glad that opening up the agrees with us. No, thank you. <laughs> Okay, we also say it's very important, we say principally because we think what we should be doing is looking at these states and disaggregating the communities there. We say firstly there's a massive problem in the kind of states that we see these governments. Use. They don't have any kind of representative government. This is another reason why we say the principle of national sovereignty on its own has been discredited. No, thank you, you sit down. Okay, so we accept, it seems only government accepts, this principle that there should be a universal and a personal sovereignty as opposed to just the application of national sovereignty.
Okay, so secondly, let's look at the real world competition. What exactly is going to work and what not going to work? Well, we say first, but there's a real chance of action. Because you know, this debate isn't about whether or not consensus is better than unilateral action. Because we say lots of people, you know, will already accept that consensus and lots of people doing things together is good. But we say it's about, you know, what's likely to happen. We say what's the hierarchy of things. We say, actually, you've got quite a good chance of getting a consensus under our law that wouldn't evolve under the status quo. So we say, for example, on an action against a country like, for example, Sudan. At the moment, we show you clearly that it's got a strong, powerful allies who will block any United Nations action. Because at the moment, they can. It's very easy. We say, when you strip away their right to block this, we say, what's going to happen is that countries like, for example, China, aren't going to want to hand over the entire control of any kind of operations, um, you know, and have nothing to do with them, just to sit around and be an obstructionist, and also, you know, make themselves be perceived as sticking up for a regime that violates human rights. So there's no interest at all trying to do that. Say, it's quite likely that people who are currently obstructionists, because they know they can get their way, and they can't get their way, will be willing to engage, will be willing to be part of a process, because it then gives them some kind of leeway in the process. We say, it's more likely that we're going to have manageable coalitions, people having genuine incentives to interact. And we think that's a good thing for keeping the international community together. We've already shown you, though, where the international community can't be kept together, because these rights are so important and unabridgable, because we're recognising that currently in trends of international law, that we must have <coughs> intervention. We think the intervention is very important. But then the PLI raised my second opposition was, you know, what about issues like Taiwan and China? We say they fundamentally misrepresent the reasons why problems don't happen there at the moment. It's not because of what the according of international law says about whether or not such an intervention would be legitimate. It's because of real politic considerations, which won't go away, whatever passage we have in this debate, whatever proclamations the United Nations make. China is still not going to invade Taiwan because of America made an judgment. Japan will still not invade China because they can't, in answer to first opposition. We say these real world things won't go away. We say countries will still negotiate informally. We've shown that there's still going to be a burden of to come from the UN and say about us. We say, moreover, there's still all these kind of back channels. And we say the only type of invasion that isn't preceded by this kind of informal negotiation is one that we have a clear international consensus that we don't like. It's hostile invasion. We say that international consensus when countries like Iraq in play places like Iraq, however they try and justify it, the international community will still reject it, ladies and gentlemen. We beg on closing government to propose. Like essentially the same thing. 
and less fire default. We think a couple of things. One, you might be able to eliminate that requirement. We don't see what that really has to do with this round in particular. But more importantly, what we'd say is they can be effective even with that limitation because they often put themselves in the way of conflict, and then if attacked, they can respond. But most importantly, what we think this fact that UN people can't fire first represents is an international consensus on what appropriate peacekeeping is. And even if you don't agree with this particular international consensus, we'd see the idea that the international, <coughs> the international community can put limitations on the sorts of actions that peacekeepers can voluntarily take is a very, very good thing. And if their, their whole thing rests on individual state actors should be able to lead any kind of intervention they want, and they don't like international consensus on the limits that they can use, then I think it's really funny when they get up and talk about like rapes and abuses by the UN, who at least have these limitations, and then somehow think that unlimited individual countries intervening are not going to have a lot worse than just rapes and abuses, at least they can break national law, because they want to get rid of those sorts of limitations. Certainly the one on firing first, at least, which we think is quite dangerous. Okay, so the next thing that we get is this idea that, uh, oh, from the second opposition, no thank you, that, uh, there's this idea that universal sovereignty of personal sovereignty above national sovereignty. And first of all, we don't accept the delineation, that they, the correlation they draw between failed states and war crimes. Because what we assume they mean is the UN's list of 115 states that have moderate to severe human rights violations where <coughs> the government is failing. 115 states do not have war crimes going on in them right now, and they themselves admit that some of these governments can in fact be saved in first proposition. So we simply don't accept that in all of these countries, the national sovereignty is necessarily much lower than personal sovereignty. We think that's the sort of judgment that an international community is much better placed to make than one single individual nation deciding if the personal sovereignty of the people involved trump the national sovereignty. No, thank you. So the final point we get is this idea of uh, real negotiations won't go away, internal informal consensus won't be stopped. We say no. We say the fact that the UN community might, if you actually try to go and build consensus, the UN community might say, well, this nation's on the list, but we'd really rather you didn't. We sort of want to put our UN stamp of approval, even though it's technically illegal, actually will deter people from seeking um, consensus in the first place, from consulting in the first place. A very good example of this is how George Bush said Colin Powell's biggest mistake was going for the second vote on the UN Security Council, because after the UN voted against it, America looked a lot worse than it would have if it had just invaded based on the first vote without taking the second vote. Why is that important? Because it means that there actually is a disincentive to seek approval from other countries, because you can do it even if they don't approve, but there's actually real consequences potentially to them disapproving, even if it's technically legal. Sure. How does the abject failure of the UN to raise volunteer mission forces change under your model? First of all, we actually think the UN has been quite successful in seeking peacekeeping forces, peacekeeping forces in lots of areas. But moreover, what we're not sure of is why, again, and I'm going to talk about this, less forces is necessarily better than too many people all trying to intervene first to make sure that their individual country's best interests get represented in however the state turns out. So let's go to this question of state judgments. Because we say is this. We think often countries will have illegitimate motivations, as lots of people say here, here. the US did in Iraq, and they will simply couch it in humanitarian intervention. And this now justifies it. For example, in 1937 in Germany, Hitler couched all of his um, in interventions in other countries on the basis of ethnic German population being oppressed. And they were, but that doesn't mean
currently, where countries communicate constantly through diplomatic channels that are all, probably not always visible, and that those are that the mass of negotiations that go forward before people even arrive at the UN. Now, I would like to firstly talk about why there is a pressing need for an improvement in intervention in these lamentable situations and how this is currently failing under the status quo. I'd like to secondly discuss the UN, see why this kind of counter-proposal is not a workable solution and how this will go to damage it. And I'd lastly like to look at why this proposal reflects accurately real policy and will go to improve diplomacy, improve relations and can even actually help out the UN itself. But first thing I'd like to look at some rebuttal. And the, first, no, and the first thing, the first thing, again, kind of complexity in investing is this one about not really understanding that, that people are going to discuss things beforehand before they get to, to the US. Kind of this thing about um, how we can't have um, states going out and doing this because they're going to um, get to the UN and then they're going to discuss it. Well, we say it's under our model. You're going to have this extensive discussion beforehand, and the fact that you just get to the um, you get to the GA uh, and then you know then it's going to be important whether states have different kind of judgment calls on it. They're going to have all these kind of judgment calls before, and in fact people are able to deal with that. And then the second thing which kind of was, was discussed briefly was that of. Um, of unilateral peace won't last because governments aren't interested. And what we would say is that the key players who are actually going to be affecting and making use of this kind of, kind of uh, legalisation are going to be those ones who have clear international standing and will want to go on to show that they can reliably solve the situation and will be doing it for those kind of reasons. They really won't want to have those kind of errors under their name and no effect. Um, so I'd like to talk firstly about why this person need. I think this is extensively kind of um, accepted and conceded by the opposition, who really believe, quite rightly, and it would be hard for them to argue otherwise, that it is unacceptable when we have the means to do so, we should intervene in crimes like genocide and the lamentable human rights situation that we see. Um, Allying, you know, like 
chumming up against, you know, like, well, we've got oil here, you've got oil here, we won't invade there if you don't invade here. There's all these kind of problems. And that brings me to another key problem which they haven't really tackled with the UN, which is that of bureaucracy. Like, there is an immense amount of bureaucracy. <coughs> when that is tied in and used as a cover for political aims, then you can easily get a situation where you don't have this not only immediate action in these cases, but you don't really have action at all because of the kind of cover that potentially First gives people to do this. And the reason we came up with this was the kind of disincentive to discuss this. Like, we don't want to, to go out there and have a resolution against it because people might vote against it and you might not know that. No, no. All we would first say to this is that these countries do not act in isolation. These people will talk to each other. They will send out their diplomatic tentacles and decide whether people are going to vote against it or not anyway. So, in fact, that is something which is kind of not, not really a disincentive at all. But this brings me on to the third point, which is really positive with our proposal. Which is that once you have allowed people, once you have said yes, we recognise that there are these terrible acts going on. We recognise that you individual country, you have the truth ready, you have the means to do this, you have that, that ability to actually improve those, those people and, and improve their situation. Then, when we come bring back into, into the kind of UN discussion, we will see that when people know that that is a realistic option, when we know that a large country that has these kind of aims can do it, then that is actually an incentive to discuss. Because it's saying, yes, we recognise this country probably will go in. And we recognise that actually we have a great deal of interest in this region, we have economic ties in this region, and we want to be part of that process. So what it really does is it pulls people in, and we think that that is the positive thing. That is why, in effect, we are actually leading to better consensus than they are. So because there is a pressing need, they've shown us, they've agreed that we're currently failing under the state. Because the UN is inherently difficult, and because it would fail under their uh, counterpart to do anything anyway, and because our proposal is positive and improves the discussion and consensus in the UN, who they have to propose. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there are three questions this round. First of all, under which situations will intervention occur under the proposition's model? Second of all, what will be the effects of that intervention? And thirdly, what are the principles underlying the change in the UN Charter and the ways in which the United Nations authorizes intervention? First of all, when will intervention occur? We see three effects. First of all, we're likely to see it occur in many more situations than it currently does because the proposition case essentially authorizes intervention into more than 50% of the states in the world. Now, they've identified a problem which is genocide existing in a handful of nations. Their solution to solving that was to authorize intervention into many more nations that don't have genocide, but have other human rights problems that have been classified as failed states. Ultimately, we see that there are two effects of this, or two possible alternatives, as Beth identified. The first is that we use the current list of failed states, in which case it's fair game on 115 states, or the list becomes politicized so that we narrow the list down into only a handful of states in which we think intervention is, is justified. No, thank you. Recognize, however, that even if political pressures narrow down the list, that situation is still not as good as the status quo, because under this narrow list, the United Nations no longer has a coordinating function in who intervenes, because ultimately they simply identify the countries in which anyone can justify the Whereas under the status quo, the United Nations identifies the country which can be intervened in, and also identifies the countries that can do the intervening. And we think that's an important power that they lose on their side of the coast. The second effect of when will intervention occur is that it will often occur when nations are only pursuing their own interests. Ultimately, they haven't given us a compelling reason today why nations, when given the opportunity to intervene, are going to intervene for humanitarian reasons. Essentially, they propose the honor system. The problem is, the reason why we have the United Nations in the first place is that the honor system doesn't work. Now, what have they told us? Well, we'll have a declaration, and that declaration is the equivalent of consultation. I don't understand how a declaration here is the equivalent of consultation. The United States made a declaration of war, but most people would not say that was sufficiently multilateral. Ultimately, a declaration is not the same as dialogue. But furthermore, what we say is problematic on their side of the house is that even if there are unauthorized interventions occurring under the status quo, even if nations will simply behave in a real, real politic way so that the rules of the United Nations are not going to affect them, there are two important differences between their side of the house and our side of the house. No thank you. The first is that if a nation illegally intervenes now, its leaders can be prosecuted. Whereas on their side of the house, if a nation intervenes for 
uh, self-interested reasons, they can't be prosecuted because they were pursuing a technically legal war. The second, yeah. the second important uh, implication is that under the status quo, if a nation illegally intervenes, other nations in the United Nations can respond by counter-intervening or defending that nation. Under their side of the house, they can't do that because it's, once again, a legal war regardless of what the intentions of the intervener are. Yes? Lots of courts on lots of issues already make judgments about whether or not a claim, like for example the claim here that it was a legal intervention, matches the reality of the fact, like were there real humanitarian abuses and what did your army do when it got there? We can still try people who commit atrocities when they intervene. Yes, but we fail to recognize that a nation can intervene in another nation transparently to do its best to stop the genocide, but still gain lots of things from that particular intervention without necessarily stopping the, uh, the genocide, or even if it does stop the genocide. No, thank you. So for example, if Japan intervened in China, what are the likely effects we'd see of that? First of all, we'd probably see the Japanese pursue their own economic interest in territories and regional waters which they claim, no thank you, in that region, because there's territorial conflicts that were disputes between the two nations, no thank you. But furthermore, we'd see worse ethnic tensions arise, we ultimately assume that ethnic tensions underlie most genocide, then we see the presence of that intervener leading to worse atrocities, no thank you. So it's an incredibly murky situation. It's incredibly hard to define what the intentions of a country are, and we're likely to see negative intentions. We need a clear line for a reason, that war is only justified if the United Nations Security Council is justified it. We give you that clear line on our side of the house, no thank you. The final issue we get on, on this idea of um, when will intervention occur is the idea of real politics we get from the second proposition, that power play negotiations will still occur, but there isn't much of a change. There are three differences. First of all, these negotiations won't be transparent in the way they are now, because now they're occurring on the Security Council. Second of all, there'll be no rules to govern these negotiations, whereas in the Security Council, there are rules. Thirdly, there are many regions of the world we don't pay much attention to. So if a nation unlawfully intervenes in another nation under the step, uh, if a nation unlawfully intervenes um, under their proposal, ultimately, very little will be done. Whereas in our Senate House, if you're obligated to act in this particular situation, or the Security Council has that power, ultimately we're going to see different types of behavior from these bodies, no thank you. That leads us to the second important issue in this debate, here, the effects. First of all, we see huge refugee problems that ultimately result in when one nation intervenes in another nation. Clearly the considerations and interests of other nations have to be taken into account, but when the action is unilateral, those interests aren't taken into account. But second of all, what we see is problematic, is that we see a less legitimate intervention because it doesn't have UN helmets or UN authorization behind it. We think that's going to lead to less trust between the occupied nation and the people who are occupying. Ultimately, that's going to harm the reconstruction effort, and more importantly, give a PR boost to the government which is trying to cling to power by oppressing its own people on that point. Well, a lot better than other nations which have Hutus or Tutsis and are intervening yeah, yeah, yeah. into a conflict between Hutus and Tutsis. That's the problem. You don't select who can intervene. So people are uh, uh, as involved in the conflict as the actual oppressors have the right to intervene on your side of the house, which we don't see as solving those ethnic tensions. But the final problem is with Reconstruction, we need other nations involved. Probably they're going to have to be involved if only one nation uh, intervenes. But unfortunately, we haven't got their consent to be involved, and we haven't involved ourselves on their terms, on terms in which everyone can work. We've seen in many nations that unilateral intervention is fairly unsuccessful at rebuilding states. That's why we need cooperation. That's why we need dialogue. And if dialogue doesn't occur in sufficient situations, that's a limitation of the real politique and institutional constraints which must exist in any world. You simply can't be avoided. The third argument, therefore, or the third issue, is this idea of principle. And the key principle is this, that the differences between states, the tensions between states, are often worse than the tensions within states. The reason the UN Security Council protects the sovereignty of nations is because throughout history we've seen one nation intervening in another unjustifiably in much more, with much more frequency than one nation oppressing its own citizens. Ultimately, we think we have to take care of that first step first, that step of international security, as Beth said, or international stability, preventing World War III before we prevent the next genocide. For those reasons, we're proud to oppose. Every day, if you dreamt, I'm sorry, like you did. You have to fight people, you have to escape.